Now we are going to try to put together all of those molecular mechanisms of contraction together with the stuff that lab covers about muscle twitches and stimulation and all that kind of stuff. And it is related. It initially doesn't seem related, but it is. So first off, um, I want to look at what's called a muscle twitch. Um, a muscle twitch is not what people usually mean when they say my muscle is twitching. What it is, is the response of a single skeletal muscle fiber to a single stimulation. And of course, that may not be adequate to start whole muscle contraction or to even make something move visibly. So the response of one muscle fiber to a single action potential on that muscle fiber and it's got three portions to it. It's got the latent period. The latent period, you see, here's the stimulus. That's when the stimulus occurred, which would be in the body when I actually hit threshold um, and I got an action potential. Um, and then the latent period is before the actual crossbridge cycling starts to occur. So we'll talk about what's going on during the latent period. And then the contraction phase or contraction time and then the relaxation time. So before we go any further, I want to put this together with what we just did, which is to look at what might be happening inside the muscle fiber during latent period contraction phase and relaxation phase. So let's do that for just a second. Okay, so what is happening right here between the stimulus and the latent period? What is happening is all of the things that precede um, actual sarcomere contraction in the skeletal muscle fiber. So what we are going to have is it's going to, we already got our action potential, but then the action potential has to move down the T-tubules and it has to hit the SR and it has to cause calcium release. And then it has to, calcium has to bind to troponin. And then tropomyosin has to move. And then um, after tropomyosin moves, you're almost there because then I get cross bridge formation. Okay, so that is why that there is actually a time, right? Because all of this stuff isn't instantaneous. So there is a latent period between when the muscle actually is stimulated and when it actually starts wiggling, even at a microscopic level. And then what's happening during the contraction phase? Contraction phase is primarily cross bridge cycling, right? In which one cross bridge forms, you um, cross bridge formation, the phosphate falls off, um, power stroke, ADP falls off, um, ATP binds and releases the cross bridge, and then you um, release and reposition by hydrolyzing ATP. So this is the cross bridge cycling, okay? And then what's happening during the relaxation phase? During the relaxation phase is when you are going to be doing all of those things that will lead to relaxation. So you've got to use acetylcholine esterase. Oops, sorry. Acetylcholine esterase. And then um, you are going to have to pump calcium back into the SR. And then when you pump calcium back into the SR, the sarcomere relaxes. So although when you're studying this in lab, it doesn't seem like it's directly related to the hardest part of skeletal muscle fiber contraction, it totally is. Um, okay, so some things that we need to discuss um, before we get into um, more fiber contraction and then whole muscle contraction. First off, the relationship between tension and load. So when you are um, generating tension, this is the force exerted on an object by a contracting muscle. So if I'm lifting up this pen, 
then the force that is exerted on an object would be the um, weight of my forearm plus the weight of this pen by this contracting muscle of my biceps brachii, my brachialis. Now, it doesn't always lead to measurable shortening. So right now I can, for instance, um, generate tension in my rectus abdominis without actually moving my body. Now, microscopically, you are definitely doing some movement, but it doesn't always lead to measurable shortening. So you can generate tension without actually overcoming what we call the load. The load is the force that is exerted on the muscle by the object. And if I put more load, then I'm going to have to generate more tension to overcome the load. So tension and load oppose one another. And the muscle generates tension, then it has to try to move the load. So now let's talk about a few types of contraction. So the first type of contraction is called an isometric contraction. And the name kind of tells you what's going on. Iso meaning same, metric implying length. So this seems counterintuitive, but a muscle can develop tension and not measurably shorten. Is it doing cross bridge cycling? Yes, but it is, is it overcoming the load? It's not overcoming the load. So for instance, holding my neck still right now is an isometric contraction. So supporting yourself in a constant position is an isometric contraction. So if we look at what's happening with an isometric contraction, what we see right here is this is a simulated isometric contraction in a lab. Um, in you, it would be happening with neurotransmitters, but you can skip the whole neurotransmitter thing and just directly stimulate the skeletal muscle fiber to threshold. So I've got a stimulator. Um, stimulator. I've got a force transducer, but I have a rigid support that this muscle doesn't have the capacity to overcome. So what's going to happen is I'm going to stimulate the muscle. It's going to generate tension, but it's not going to generate any movement, okay? Because the origin and the insertion of the muscle or the muscle fiber did not move any closer to one another. Is it still using ATP? It is, right? but the tension didn't overcome the load. So you can sketch an isometric twitch here. Make sure you play, pay attention to the fact that the time and the tension is what's going on. It's not movement, okay? So, um, and then label latent period, contraction phase and relaxation phase because this guy right here that you just look like, this, this was an isometric twitch and this is just a, a more complicated picture of an isometric um, isometric muscle contraction. Okay, and then there is another kind of muscle contraction which is called an isotonic muscle contraction. And this one's a little harder for people to understand, so listen carefully. Um, what happens with an isotonic contraction is what you typically think of as muscle contraction, like I'm moving, right? I'm using this tension to overcome this load. So it's muscle is shortening, moving a constant load. This is how you walk, this is how I'm talking. But looking at the graph can be a little confusing, so let's look at it together. Okay, the difference between this setup and an isometric um, contraction setup is that I make the load movable with the amount of tension that that muscle can generate. And so what's going to happen is this is on a lever, right? And I'd have to experiment with this to make sure that the um, tension that muscle can generate could actually overcome the load that I'm using and I'm going to stimulate it, and I am not only measuring the degree of tension, I'm also measuring the length, uh, the shortening, okay? So what's going to happen, I'm going to stimulate it, and for a minute, it's just going to generate tension, and the tension is going to increase. But then, once you've generated enough tension, instead of just continuing to generate tension, you are actually going to move. So this one, the y-axis is tension. Tension goes up, 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 and then you don't just continue to generate tension because once I actually generated enough tension, I can use it for movement. And then I am actually going to shorten. So why is this called an isotonic contraction? Because once I get enough tension or tone, tonic, I can stop generating tension, right? So, and then I can use it for shortening. 
okay? So what's going to happen is initially I'm not going to be wiggling because I haven't generated enough tension and then I do wiggle. So this is called an isotonic contraction and this is what we normally think of as muscle contractions. Okay, we're gonna stop there.